Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the New Frontier Awards. Um, I know there are people here from the national campaign, and we're so excited uh, to have you here and um, so excited uh, for you to be able to participate in New Hampshire tomorrow in this, such an exciting year uh, for people who care about politics, for the Kennedy School, and for all of your schools. Um, I want to... Um, my um, son has become the chairman of the New Frontier Award Committee, and so I have been retired for the last year, but he was unable to come today, so I am filling in for him, and so I have to uh, regroup here a little bit on the logistics. But um, from my own history, I've been part of this program for the 15 years that we've been giving out this award, and uh, we started it because uh, the mission of the Kennedy Library and the Institute of Politics and the Kennedy School is to encourage the next generation of leaders uh, in the spirit of President Kennedy to seek careers in public service. And that can be service of any kind. As you heard uh, from the New Frontier speech, my father always um, dreamed big and called upon all Americans to give back to this country that's given us all so much. And so um, we hope that you will find inspiration here uh, whether you're a student here or whether you're a visitor, um, Harvard is the place where my father really developed his own interests in government and history uh, and, um, and the ideals that he uh, stood for throughout his career. So um, it's wonderful to be able to return here uh, to the touchstone of those ideals and, um, and to share them with people who are living them every day. Um, and the New Frontier Award recipients uh, are an extraordinary group, and this year's group um, is even more extraordinary than the people we've had in the past. So the best thing about the New Frontier Award winners is that they go on to do even more incredible things after they receive this award. So it reflects um, President Kennedy's ideal that, um, that the young are always uh, the people who will lead us into the future, and um, we hope that you will follow their, their progress, be inspired by them um, as you make your own decisions um, to go forward. So I want to thank Hannah and the interns who worked on this. I want to thank um, Mark Deeran, the director of the Institute of Politics, and Rachel DeFleur, um, the director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, Alan Price, the director of the Kennedy Library, Dan Fenn, who worked for President Kennedy in the White House, uh, and has been uh, a part of this award since its inception. Um, and uh, Megan Hull, uh, who has run this award uh, with Christian Flynn from the IOP and also Amy Howell, the executive director. So we couldn't do this without all of you and we're so lucky to have um, people of your extraordinary caliber uh, making President Kennedy's ideals live on. Um, there's a wonderful committee that chooses this, um, led by a wonderful chairman, which is Jack, and um, uh, hopefully he's, you know, watching from home, and so he could hear me, you know, say all this. But um, I want to welcome our nominees, uh, Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib from Washington State, and the co-founders of the Freedom for Immigrants, um, organization, Christina Fialho and Christina Mansfield, uh, who are here with some of their staff and guests, um, and so we are honored to celebrate them uh, this evening. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I think for me, one of the really um, most meaningful quotes is the one that we heard a little while ago, which is the new frontier. Um, like the profile in Courage, uh, uh, New Frontier has become uh, an iconic phrase and a symbol of what we as Americans um, need always to be reaching for. And um, I think uh, we've certainly seen a lot of uh, opportunities for courage and we've seen a few real acts of courage recently. Um, it's, it's a time in which we're all called upon to, um, to live our values and, um, and be true to our consciences. And so um, it's wonderful that these awards and his um, ideals are, are being celebrated and animated by a new generation. Um, okay, so now I have 
Um, I'm going to move on to the first um, award. And I have some remarks that my son Jack wrote um, about uh, Lieutenant Governor Habib. And so I'm going to read those. And you can imagine me as a 27-year-old man. <laughs> so just close your eyes for a moment. And um, OK, wait a second. Um, so here, this is Jack speaking now. Good evening and welcome to the New Frontier Awards. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, President Kennedy was many things, but more than anything, he was young. He was the youngest man ever elected president and part of a new generation that asked what they could do for our country. That's really what the New Frontier was. It wasn't just an agenda or set of policies. It described the fearless, patriotic spirit of a generation that welcomed the call to serve. We're here tonight to carry on that tradition, celebrate young leadership, and we're reminded of what has always been true in America. Progress and change depend on the energy, optimism, and boldness of young people imagining a better world. I think every generation has felt what we're feeling now, anxious and uncertain, frustrated by tired debates among the same old guard, but nothing gets better when we throw up our hands. So it's our job to light a candle, to shine light where no one's looking, and find the people who are working towards a brighter future. That's exactly what Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib is doing in his state of Washington, where he's held elective office since 2012, when he won a seat in the state's House of Representatives. From there, he moved up to the state Senate and was elected Democratic Whip by his peers. And then, most recently, in 2017, he was elected lieutenant governor after he won a competitive primary and ultimately general election on the ticket with Governor Jay Inslee, making him the first Iranian American to hold statewide elective office in this country. It seems like people really like Cyrus. In fact, during our selection committee, I heard over and over the same thing about him. He's incredible, smartest guy you'll ever meet a star. Everyone loves him. The more research I did, the more unqualified praise I heard. I wanted to find out the real story, so I spoke to the most unbiased source I could find, Judge Susan Amini, Cyrus's mom. <laughs> she told me how her son had lost his sight at eight years old, battling cancer as a child. She told me that she did whatever she could to help him, but really that Cyrus was the leader in his own destiny. She gave me an example. Cyrus learned to ski as a blind person. He'd call her after day on the mountain and enthusiastically say, Mom, I fell 20 feet, to which she would reply, OK, great, do it again. But what about his political skills, I asked. Was he always so convincing? Apparently, he was. Whenever he got in trouble, she told me, he would debate with his mom until she was convinced she had made a mistake, not Cyrus. <laughs> and before our conversation ended, Judge Amini slipped in just one more interesting fact about her son. He climbed Mount Kilimanjaro last year. Uh, yesterday afternoon, um, uh, my daughter was over, who's just written a book about climate change, and she had uh, recently interviewed Governor Inslee, so we reached out um, to him to see if he has had any uh, words to add um, about his lieutenant governor. And this is what he sent this afternoon. Um, Cyrus is a constant inspiration, not just because of his elected office, but because of his life. All parts of his life inspire every day. He's done great things for Washington State, and this award is a recognition of his accomplishments and what he will do for our state and our country in the years to come. And if all this weren't enough, the lieutenant governor has a strong record of achievement on critical issues like education and climate change. This is Jack now. His scholarship program has changed students' lives and let them see the world. And the Inslee Habib administration is among our nation's leaders on aggressive climate change policy action. Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib challenges the rhetoric we hear today about a new generation of Americans that doesn't care. 
work hard or get things done. He's done all of that and more, and I'm honored to present him with the John F. Kennedy New Frontier Award. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you, Ambassador Kennedy, and let me begin by uh, sharing my gratitude um, uh, not only to Ambassador Kennedy but to her son Jack um, for his kind words, um, to everyone who's made this possible, the Institute of Politics, the Kennedy School of Government, uh, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library Foundation, um, and uh, I want to thank a few guests that I have here with me, uh, without whom I wouldn't be here. Um, three individuals who uh, got me elected and who have made sure that I haven't then squandered that position by messing up too badly in office, by being really my closest advisors, trusted friends, um, and um, staff throughout these uh, seven years that I've been in elected office. Libby Hollingshead, Miranda Roberts, and Christina Brown who are all here, and I, I, I hope and I know that every elected official who wins this award, I'm sure, uh, says and knows this, that um, we are nothing without the men and women that work with us, work in our offices, and make it possible for us to do the work of the people. They, they, they don't often win uh, and are, don't have the opportunity to win awards like this, but they are what makes this country great, what makes our government work so well. Um, I wanna thank the uh, uh, friends that I have who are here, Thank you for celebrating this with me, and I want to uh, uh, thank and um, offer my full-throated support to all the young people who are here uh, for this conference um, and my excitement for all of you. Uh, let me say a couple things about family because um, this is a, a Kennedy event, and I think um, it's impossible for us to think about President Kennedy without also thinking about his family and uh, that's most clearly on display here um, with his beloved daughter um, and his grandson's leadership of this committee. Um, but let me talk about my parents for just a quick moment. Um, my father passed away in 2016, just a few weeks before I was elected lieutenant governor and after a three and a half year battle with cancer. And um, I'll tell you why I know he's smiling down on me right now. Uh, it's because, uh, you know, coming from an immigrant family, uh, what's, the, what's the biggest uh, and, and highest and best hope that every immigrant family has for their kid? Um, it's not health or, or happiness uh, or even prosperity. It's actually that they go to Harvard. <laughs> um, and, and so, um, and so, uh, and so I, I wanted to make my parents happy, and so I, I actually applied early decision to Harvard and di didn't get in. Um, and, um, but went to a, a fantastic university, I went to Columbia um, for college, but then when law school came around, um, you know, my dad knew that I'd, I'd gotten good grades, so he was excited that I was gonna apply to law school. He thought maybe I'd shot to get into Harvard Law School, and so I did, I applied, and I did get into Harvard Law School, but I also got into another law school, it's, it may be dangerous to mention it here uh, in this town, um, but I got into Yale Law School, and so I'll never forget when I went and told him, you know, Dad, uh, I've decided that I want to go to Yale Law School. And my dad goes, wait, I, but I thought you, you did get into Harvard. And I said, yeah, I, I, I did. And he said, well, I don't understand. Well, <laughs> why wouldn't you go there? And, he's, and I said, well, you know, this focus on public interest, and this is where I want to go, and whatever. And, and he said, all right, well, we've never told you what to do. Never, you know, we've always supported you, encouraged you, whatever you want to do. But here's what I'll tell you. You go to Yale, study hard, get your degree, and then you can frame that degree. I'm going to take the admission letter, letter of acceptance from Harvard Law School. I'm going to have that framed and keep it. So that was his love of this institution. So now, finally, he knows that I've received 
an award, let's call it a degree, that I've received recognition from Harvard University. So I know that he's smiling down from heaven. And without him, without him coming to this country and finding a new frontier as an Iranian 17-year-old, finding the University of Washington, I wouldn't be here, wouldn't be in the United States, wouldn't have been able to enjoy the benefits of this country for a person with a disability. And then my mom, and you heard Ambassador Kennedy mention, or Judge Susan Amini, who uh, uh, inspires me each and every single day uh, as a public servant, one of the first Iranian-American women to run for anything in this country. Um, and I often tell the story of how when I was in third grade, I'd recently become blind. And uh, the school where I was going uh, to third grade didn't, didn't want me to play out on the playground with the other kids at recess time because they feared, well, in part because they knew that I'd become blind recently, in part because they knew my mother was a litigator. They thought it wouldn't be a great idea to have me play on the playground equipment, so they kept me by the sidelines while the other kids were having fun. I went home and told my parents I was being excluded. My mom went to the principal's office the next day, and she took me with her so I could learn from her how to advocate for myself. And she said to the school, I'm gonna take my son to your school and I'm gonna teach him how to get around the playground and use the jungle gym and the swings and slides and everything and he's gonna learn his way around differently, but he's gonna learn his way around and have fun just as well as any other kid. And then she said, you know, it may happen that my son might slip and fall and he may even slip and fall and break his arm. That's a fear that any mother has. But then she said, I can fix a broken arm, but I can never fix a broken spirit. So I wanted to tell you about my folks Again, in part because that's part of the Kennedy legacy in the Kennedy family way, but also so that you understand how it was that I was able to find my new frontier in this country, in the great state of Washington. And so let me just say one more word about new frontiers. Um, I think if you look at those two words, you can find something special and important about each one of them. Why did he say frontier? You know, there's another word that I think probably a lot of politicians, unfortunately, these days would, would use instead. Maybe instead of a frontier, they'd talk about a battle line, right? They'd talk about, you know, a fight across lines. Instead of, instead of a frontier, a battle line. And I think what's, what's important here is that for President Kennedy, this wasn't about a battle with some other force or an opposition. Keep in mind, the new frontier that he talked about 60 years ago this year was not a set of policy initiatives, though his presidency had many of those, short-lived as it was. But it was about pushing oneself across that next horizon, across that next boundary, to go out into the playground as my mom inspired me to do and allowed me to do, but to go out and take risks and to push oneself and to keep one's spirit from being broken and in fact to grow one's spirit and to grow the spirit of the country. And so that's why I think it's so important that President Kennedy spoke of a frontier, not, as we hear about all too often these days, a, a battle line. And then new, a new frontier. And this is so important, you know, I was, at the library, the Kennedy Presidential Library earlier today, and I was struck by how, in a mere two and a half years, that administration tackled so many challenges, domestic and foreign, that you would think it was a two-term presidency. Right? You would think it would be it was an eight-year presidency with what he did in less than three years. And that's because there was a boldness to him. There was a boldness to his vision for our country. And so we need to remember, as we strive for those frontiers, let them be new frontiers. Let us not retread those struggles and battles of the past, but inspired by young people like the Christinas that you'll hear from in a moment, from Freedom for Immigrants. Let us be inspired by all those who are calling us to new challenges, to new frontiers, to boldness, rather than the modesty of reduced expectations and social media call-out culture. So I think about New Frontiers in a new way, having received this great honor, 
and I, uh, and, I, and I accept it with tremendous humility. Let me say one final thing, which is that um, to Ambassador Kennedy and to her son who's watching and to others in that family, that as someone who has suffered from cancer myself multiple times, as someone who lost my father to cancer, uh, it's extremely inspiring to know and to hold up as role models in this country individuals who have suffered tremendous tragedies and then virtually immediately turn their attention to how they can tend to the needs of others, to bind up the wounds of others, to take care of others. It's so hard. You know, as one of our great writers said, the world breaks us all, but some of us learn to grow in the broken places. And President Kennedy's legacy, while it shouldn't be by any means reduced to his untimely death, does also remind us through his children, grandchildren, the loss of his son as well, um, it all reminds us of how much pain this world can inflict, but that whether it was for him through the inspiration of Catholic social teaching that meant so much or whatever tradition it is that inspires us that we can be called to overcome that pain and suffering perhaps best when we put others first and put ourselves to the service of others. That to me also is the meaning of the new frontier. So thank you, Ambassador Kennedy. Thank you to the committee and all who've made this possible. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I think I speak for everyone in this audience uh, to say how um, inspired we are by uh, your words and, and your actions. Um, I think it's uh, especially meaningful this year that even though um, uh, these awards are not connected, um, we have a core um, similarity that goes to the heart of my own family's history um, as well as the history of this country, and that is um, the role of immigration and that immigrants have played. But before I speak about the next winners, I want to recognize my cousin here, Stephen Smith, who um, has been a dedicated board member of the Kennedy Library uh, and, um, and works here at Harvard. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else here uh, from my family. Last year there was some cousins or second cousins, but um, maybe they're in New Hampshire this year. I don't know what they're doing. Um, the, um, when we began this award, it was uh, 15 or 16 years ago, and we wanted to honor um, young people, the next generation of leaders. And we realized that um, the mission of the Institute of Politics um, is to inspire leaders to seek careers in public service. And what we find often is that people feel like they don't want to do politics, but they want to serve in their communities, and they want to make a difference, and they want to change our society. And often um, people find the way to do that uh, is not in government, but it is in uh, work in nonprofits and uh, social action, community-based organizations. And so we decided to give two awards, one to an elected official under the age of 40, and one to um, an unelected official who was making change in our country um, as well. And so um, this year, the winners of the unelected category um, are uh, unfortunately have become known to us as the Christinas, but actually um, they are the founding founders of Freedom for Immigrants, uh, an organization that they started 15 years ago, almost, um, and they, um, in California. And I think um, it works on behalf of immigrants to um, humanize uh, and prevent them from being in detention 
Um, they have had an extraordinary success. They were on the front lines of this fight long before it hit the headlines and hit the TV screens. And the, the um, progress that they have made by pushing for change from outside of government is truly extraordinary. Uh, they created a hotline for immigrants in detention to call in 2013 um, so that they would not be so isolated, um, but could stay in touch with the outside world, their families and lawyers. They started the first visitation program in California. They now run 43 programs around the country, um, meaning in 43 prisons. Um, they helped pass the Dignity Not Detention Act in California, which strengthens the rules for uh, detention facilities. They were the first to put a moratorium on the expansion of detention and to freeze the growth of for-profit prisons and pave the way uh, for a bill to phase out private prisons in California, which was signed into law last year. That is a model for our nation, and um, the fact that they got it done <coughs> uh, is uh, something that we can all build upon. There are now, uh, there, at one time, there were 50,000 people in immigration detention in the United States with no access to an attorney, phone call, or speedy trial, and two-thirds of them are in private, for-profit prisons. Uh, so the mission of Freedom for Immigrants is to abolish that kind of uh, system, to abolish immigration detention, and end the isolation of people suffering. You will hear some extraordinary facts um, about what people uh, face who come to this country fleeing violence and conflict in their own countries, um, I hope, um, because I was just hearing some of them. Um, there are 4,500 volunteers weekly monitoring U.S. detention centers now, um, and the hotline gets 14,000 calls a month. It's the largest in the United States. Um, there are, uh, so this is an organization that has had impact well beyond um, even California, um, although in California it's um, truly groundbreaking. And I know that um, in my own family, the history of uh, the immigrant experience, which is now many generations removed, um, was something that my own grandmother felt uh, strongly in her own life. Um, it's hard to, to remember that here in Boston the Irish were discriminated against, um, and it was something that she herself had experienced. And so, um, so even though it's, it's not part of my experience and all of us here are lucky enough to be here, um, and some of us are even lucky enough to have turned it down, um, but, uh, but I think that um, it's something that it, we are now seeing uh, firsthand, uh, the importance of um, renewing our values and treating people with dignity and respect. And this is a crisis situation, and I hope that everybody here uh, we'll spend some time thinking about it and thinking about um, our own heritage. Um, my father served on the immigration subcommittee. He wrote a book called The Nation of Immigrants. It was so central to our family's experience. Um, and my uncle Teddy uh, also chaired that subcommittee uh, almost throughout his entire time in Congress. Uh, so both of them worked uh, hard to be able to um, bring more immigrants to this country and celebrate the contributions that they make. So it's an honor for me personally uh, to welcome you here today um, and to be uh, inspired by your work. And I hope that um, I can and we all can uh, continue to help this cause. So I want to present you with the New Frontier Award um, to Christina Mansfield and Christina Fialho and Freedom for Immigrants. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kennedy. We are so honored to accept this award. This award is deeply meaningful for me and my family. When President Kennedy was senator of this state, he authored a bill that brought my great-grandfather to the United States. Then my grandparents followed along with my dad. I wouldn't even be here if the United States hadn't welcomed my family in a time of crisis. But not all families are treated equally. 
Right now, as we speak, there are over 50,000 people held in county jails and for-profit prisons as part of the U.S. immigration detention system. Immigration detention is rife with abuse, such as medical neglect that has led to death and sexual assault by guards perpetrated with our tax dollars. But this wasn't always the case. Prior to the 1980s, there were only about 30 people held in immigration detention on any given day. Then, two private prison corporations formed, and they began lobbying for laws to expand immigrant incarceration. Now, 70% of people in immigration detention are caged in private prisons, profiting from their abuse. But it doesn't have to be this way. Many of us in this room are old enough to have lived in a country where people were not systematically imprisoned for crossing a border. We can end this system, and we are so grateful to the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation for uplifting our work at this time. When Christina and I started doing this work uh, about a decade ago, it was a totally different political environment. And when people asked us what we did for a living, we were often met with blank stares, and no one, no one knew that we had an immigration detention system. And today, this has changed. The issue is finally front and center where it belongs as, as one of the most pressing social justice issues of our time. Um, and so, with this recognition of this award, comes a responsibility for all of us to, to act boldly and to completely reimagine how we treat immigrants in this country. Um, I want to give a, a lot of thanks. <laughs> um, I want to just say that we're just one small organization in a sea of people trying to make this change. And many of them are, are directly impacted by this issue in a way that we aren't. And I want to thank our families who are here tonight. Um, you've made us who we are. We're so grateful to you. I want to especially thank my partner, Nick Castro, who helped us to build this organization in the very early years. Thank you, Nick. Um, I want to thank our staff who work really tirelessly every single day um, and, you know, make a lot of personal sacrifices because it's difficult to withstand the weight of the suffering that we have to witness on a daily basis. And we want to thank our board and our leadership, leadership council, our donors, our supporters who have helped us build uh, this resistance. And we want to thank all the people we've had the honor of working with in immigration detention. We stand with you, and we're going to bring an end to this cruel and un unnecessary system together. And a tremendous thanks to the JFK Library Foundation for recognizing this issue, for recognizing our contributions, and helping us pave the way toward abolition, our new frontier. Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to have a, a short um, conversation, and um, I'm hoping that we'll have time to take some, we will have time to take some questions from the audience, because um, I'm sure that all of you have uh, questions for our honorees. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll just start by, um, I guess, asking you what, um, what was it that, or what advice, how did you decide to, what really set you on your path to public service? At what point did you feel like, this is how I want to spend my life? And maybe, you know, what was a pathway that you feel would be helpful to people who are trying to figure out whether or not they can do that? Um, I don't know, Lieutenant Governor, would you like to start, or? Sure. Um, well, I, I mentioned the playground story, and, and the, the coda to that is that as I grew older, there were, other occasions where I was personally excluded and had to fight to be included, and 
And then as I, as I got even older, I realized, and so I learned how to advocate for myself in those situations. Then as I got older, I realized how many others were being excluded for, for different reasons, not, not just because they're blind, but for economic reasons, racial reasons, gender, and others. And, um, and that most of them were not fortunate enough to have a 24-hour-a-day pro bono attorney as a mom, right? <laughs> and so, um, so I, I decided that I didn't want anyone to feel that way. Um, and that's, so that, that's why I went to law school and ultimately why I ran for the legislature to try to find those opportunities or those situations where um, people are, are not being let out on the, on the playground of life, so to speak, and to try to give them that chance. Thank you. you, you yeah, you I, can, I can speak a little. Um, I grew up Catholic, and part of the Catholic tradition, Catholic faith, is kind of to find your calling. Um, to discern what your purpose in life is. Um, and for me, that became sort of an obsession from a young age, trying to figure out why was I put on this earth. And I never really thought about immigration as an issue. It was something that I grew up with um, in an immigrant household with my dad. My mom's parents are also from um, Madeira, um, immigrated here. And so immigration wasn't really an issue for me. It was just part of my life. But as I started to learn more about the immigration system, about um, homelessness issues, about our prison system, and how all of these converge, it was very clear to me that immigration detention was a wrong in our society that we needed to eradicate. The very first person that I visited with in immigration detention was a victim of sex trafficking. And instead of protecting her, the US government detained her. And that's not why my family came to the United States. Those are not the ideals of this country, um, but it's the reality. And we need to fight against that and uplift our values. And uh, for me, um, my parents have always been an incredible inspiration. Um, my mother, my mother, uh, was impacted by family separation in, in a way that was really difficult for her. Uh, she, she gave up a son for adoption in, in 1969, and um, her son, my brother Josh, is of African-American descent. And for her, um, it was a very difficult decision and a very difficult environment to be able to um, you know, have that child. And when I was uh, 16, years old, I found out uh, that this was the reality that she had lived with. Um, and I, I now know my brother Josh, and we're all a family, and it, it's wonderful. Um, but I think I, I recognized how uh, adversely impacted she was, how adversely impacted my brother was, and really how trauma uh, you know, trickles down the generations, and we're all impacted by it. Um, and so when I started learning about the immigration detention system, I recognized that it was this, you know, different form of, of family separation that was very akin uh, to what my own family had been through. Uh, so I guess um, I have a million questions, and I'm sure that all of you do too. So if you have questions, um, I think we have a, a system, so you could think about it while, well, I see already hands up, so I'm gonna let people here in the audience ask questions because I'm gonna get a chance to ask you some more later myself. Um, but, sure. Oh, great. Um, there is an Iranian-American woman running for Congress in Houston, by the way. I don't know if you know that. Um, so um, I would tell you more, but we're at a nonprofit event, so I can't, I can't <laughs> mess things up. Um, but well, we can talk about it later. But, um, but I will say, you know, it is, um, I feel blessed that in, in my state, we are um, an open-minded state. We are, um, Ambassador Kennedy will, will know her, um, her former colleague, Gary Locke, who was the first Asian American governor in, in the continental US, um, was uh, our governor uh, in Washington state before becoming ambassador to China. So we, uh, we have a history of um, some firsts 
And, um, and that's, you know, I think a testament to our open-mindedness, um, the political culture in Washington State. Um, but there were definitely uh, some incidents that were really unfortunate, and, and they, can, they still happen sometimes. Um, I, I don't want to amplify it, but, you know, if you happen to stumble upon my social media, you will see, um, you know, stop trying to impose Sharia law in, in our state or these kinds of things, ignorant comments um, that people make. It hasn't, it hasn't stopped me, um, but uh, it is uh, uh, desolating. Uh, I would say, actually, the, the bigger challenge for me has been convincing people, has been navigating the issue of being blind and running because um, it's a tricky thing where people like the human interest element of it, but in politics, they want more than that. They want to know that you're going to be effective and competent and strong for them. And so being able to um, communicate both like, hey, I'm wearing sunglasses because I'm blind, not just because I think I'm cool. That's why. But then it's OK to be blind. That doesn't mean that I'm ineffective or that I'm weak or whatever. I mean, those things have been a little bit more challenging. Um, but, but again, um, thank God it's, it's worked out. And the Iranian American, one more. The Iranian American community has also been very supportive of me too, which I think is is really wonderful. Yeah, well, when we first started doing this work, um, California, our home state, detained a quarter of all people in immigration detention, which is crazy to us. California, you don't think that that's where the majority of people are being detained, but they were. Um, and so we set out to really create a system where we were engaging community members to visit people in detention because this, this atrocity, these abuses are happening, like I said, with our tax dollars, but also in our backyard. And so we have an opportunity to visit people literally in, in our backyard. Um, and that is where the kind of the relationship starts. And through the relationship, so much can, can happen. So you can monitor detention conditions, but you can also organize with people inside to push for policy change. So in 2016, we ran our first bill to try to create a moratorium on immigration detention expansion in California. And we thought this was a pipeline, you know, pipe dream. It wasn't gonna actually happen. And the first year, it actually was vetoed by our governor. But the next year, it passed and was signed into law. And it really is a model for what other states are, are now doing. Even in um, the Lieutenant Governor's home state of Washington, there's a bill just like Dignity Not Detention trying to, to abolish immigration detention, particularly private prisons in the state of Washington. And other states are trying to follow our lead. And at the federal level, we've been able to partner with Senator Kamala Harris and Congresswoman Jayapal to introduce the Dunn Act to put a federal moratorium on immigration detention expansion. And this is really all because of relationships. So I think that's really the heart of you know, entering into any issue is really forming relationships with people who, who are impacted if you're not impacted yourself and really listening to them about how they think that the system needs to change and how it needs to change and taking leadership from folks who are directly impacted by the issues of our time. Hi, um, I'm Brendan Mills from St. Anselm College and I'm graduating soon. And um, I just, this is a question for all three of you. What's one piece of advice you wish you knew before you graduated? Uh, you guys first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I mean, I think for me, um, I think imagination is key with any of this. Um, being creative in how you approach your life so don't feel like you have to kind of take that one road um, or, um, you know, uh, feel free to kind of experiment with different jobs, different, um, 
different passions within you because I think the, the best life for myself is a life where I'm actually doing something that I feel completely in tune with and, and that is one that is, is a, comes from that creative spirit within you. I guess I would say, um, you know, I, 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 A, I want to associate myself with that last remark. I think that, that, um, that is 100% true, and I think, re but I, and I would say related to that is, um, you know, think about, so it's okay to have a 20-year plan or 30-year plan or whatever it might be. Um, some, some things are important and difficult and require a lot of time, and it's, it's okay, it's good. It doesn't mean you're overly ambitious. It's actually a good thing, but I think, um, what I would say is um, build in those gap years and those those opportunities to to be creative, as as Christina said, and and um, maybe to do something that doesn't fit neatly into that plan or scheme, and it may end up not only um, ch it could change your life or it could enrich that thing that you already were planning on doing. So maybe that means living in a place that's completely different than. Where, um, where, where you would naturally go for your, your next step or whatever it might be. Um, maybe it's participating in um, the great uh, Peace Corps program that is also a legacy of um, this administration. And so, um, not this, the Kennedy administration. <laughs> um, and so, um, and so, so those, are, those are kind of things I would, I would, I would encourage. And I would just say, um I would say do something that you believe in. Uh, maybe in the, in the back by the tree, you? Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Aya. I'm a freshman at Tufts University. Um, I'm very much interested in economic development in the Middle East and North Africa, but for the mentors that I've talked to, um, they sort of let me know that sometimes it can get hard because these systems that I want to work in are so austere and people are very much, can be, the politicians can be very much corrupted and they make it hard for you to try to come in and make change and sort of benefit the people. So from your perspective of doing such great things, how do you keep true to yourself and not get tangled up in the messed up policies that sort of keep people at a disadvantaged area? I, th I think um, for, for myself, I kind of thrive uh, in an environment of adversity. Um, and, I, and I thrive when I'm advocating on behalf of others. Um, so I think if that resonates with you, um, it's, it's a way to sort of avoid in, that kind of entanglement, even though it's absolutely a reality and, and will make, we'll make things difficult. I think um, th that's obviously something that comes up if you are in a legislative body. Um, the issue of when do you compromise, um, when do you stay true and pure. And I think that it's an individual, I mean, it, it's, it's case by case. And I think that, um, you know, um, Christina mentioned the discernment. Um, and that, that, that process, whatever tradition you, um, you come from, religious or philosophical, um, but basically having a system of ethics um, by which you think about, okay, when, when am I going too far? Um, because you, you can't be pure. You just can't, there's, there's no such thing. Um, but that doesn't mean that we um, throw our hands up and say, okay, um, cynically say then okay then then there's no rules anything goes that's not true either well how do you decide and that's got to come from your conscience that's that and that conscience should be formed and informed by um, the values to which you adhere and um, and then it, it's a it's a constant process of discernment each and every day as you go through and you're given alternatives and options and choices and so on well, what do I want to do Um, hi, um, I'm, uh, hello, I'm Crystal, <laughs> sorry, um, I'm a freshman at Columbia University, thank you again so, 
for speaking, really. Um, so my question is inspired by Mr. Habib's um, um, anecdote about the playground, but um, any of you can answer. So what I found interesting in your anecdote was that the school's explanation for why they couldn't let you play with the other students is it's, it's interesting now how it's so benign it, it seems in that they could easily say, oh, we're, co we're concerned about your safety, so it's in your best interest to not play with the other st students um, given, given your disability. And so, and you can answer this, but um, how do you respond to, um, in your work for th regarding social justice um, and oppression, how do you respond to those who give benign, benign but incomplete explanations and justifications for um, justifying the status quo? I would, I would say um, ask them whether that is a position that they would want applied to, the, to them, to themselves. Um, you know, so, so sometimes my, what my mom would say, for example, um, you know, I wanted to participate in Model UN. And um, the teacher who was the advisor for Model UN in my high school really didn't want to have to think about, okay, who's gonna lead this blind kid around? And you know, if we go for, the, for a weekend trip, like who's gonna make sure he's okay, he doesn't get lost or whatever, you know? And so they didn't want me to participate. They were actively telling me that there's no, well, we can't, we can't do that. And so, um, and my mom goes and says, what do you mean you can't do that? This is, you know, this is the law. And, and they said, well, it's not mandatory. It's not part of school. It's not, it's not a required thing. You know, and my mom said, well, great, because if it's not mandatory, then I guess none of the students <laughs> in your school need to do Model UN. And I think that's the, you know, and, it, and it's, it's true, not as a glib, you know, kind of, um, gotcha, but actually to say, you know, um, turn the tables. And, and would you want to, um, would you want to live that way? Would you want to be treated that way? Um, and that's how I think you can get in. And, and I, I, I'll just tell you the area that we work on most in my office now is in the area of higher education. And you will hear people say, again, from a, to your, use your word, in a benign way, they will say, you know, college isn't for everyone. And I'm not here to say that every person we should make it compulsory, but when I hear people say college isn't for everyone, and I ask them, okay, did you go to college? Turns out the person saying college isn't for everyone went to college themselves and is sending their own kids to college. So I think, again, and it doesn't have to be, it's how you do it matters. Um, sometimes if I'm hangry, I will kind of point it out like they're being hypocritical. At my, my, my better moments, I try to be a little bit more artful and, and gentle in, in how I make them think about that. I'll also just say too that I think the, you have to look past some of the reasons or the reasoning that you're given. Um, that goes directly to kind of, I think, the reason why you're asking that question to begin with. Um, and I'll give you a concrete example from our own work. So um, our, we believe strongly that we have a right to visit people in immigration detention and provide them with support while they're suffering, but we also have an obligation to speak out when we see abuse, to speak out against the system. And every time that we've done that, or many times that we've done that, we've been met with retaliation by the government. And so, you know, I wrote a blog for the Huffington Post, and the government shut down three of our visitation programs. This has now happened um, almost a dozen times. Most recently, and we have a lawsuit pending at the moment, um, where we were featured on Orange is the New Black, our national hotline that Ambassador Kennedy spoke about. And within two weeks, the government shut down our entire hotline, um, and so we sued. Um, but the government has always given us reasons for why they have done this that aren't the true reasons. They, they, it's, it's really because they're trying to silence the truth. And, and I think most of what's happening, um, or most of the reasons for many of the issues is a trying to you know, silence the truth. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more. So maybe, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> uh, there you are. Okay, um, well, I don't want to deprive anybody, so how about, how about, would you like them to ask their questions and then you can kind of answer what you want, or? 
<laughs> Would you like to go? How many? OK. OK, five questions. And I'm going to leave it to the people with the microphones to um, answer. But if somebody asks a question that you were thinking of asking, maybe you, we could move on to the, to the next person. Or why don't we have two people go, and then you can answer those two questions. So you, and then the next person. Hello, my name is Gabriela Hernandez. I go to the University of Virginia. Um, so my question is for the Christinas. Um, Sorry. So <laughs> Um, so you guys mentioned that you guys are, um, you and your team are like, you often see the harsh realities that immigrants face. So my question for you is, how do you guys stay positive and, uh, you know, maintain motivation, you know, to keep going? So why don't we have another question asked, you're standing, and then they can sort of answer. Okay. Hello, my name is Carlos Adolfo Gonzalez. I am a master's in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. And um, my question has to do with public service. So many of us came to the Kennedy School to learn how to be effective policymakers, and some of us aspire to enter public office as a way to serve our communities. And my question is directed at Lieutenant Governor Habib. Um, as someone right now serving in elected government, uh, what is one piece of advice you would share with aspiring leaders and policymakers of how to be effective uh, once we enter public service so we can deliver for our constituents? I think um, in regards to your question, um, it is tremendously difficult work um, and it definitely takes its toll. Um, but I think, you know, we are taking our cue from people on the front lines of this fight, people who are imprisoned and, you know, they are a constant source of inspiration and, and it is through our relationships with those people that we are able to continue continue on. And I just want to uplift one person in particular. There was a, a gentleman that we worked with for a number of years while he was in immigration detention. He was actually in immigration detention for nine years and four months. He was an asylum seeker from Kenya. Um, he was originally detained in California, but we met him in a county jail in Alabama. And we helped him, you know, working with him on the inside to uplift the abuse that was happening inside of that particular jail. And then we helped him to get transferred to California and released on bond. Um, and now he, is, he has a child, he's married, he runs a successful food truck called Rafiki's Foods in San Diego. And, and if somebody can survive through that type of trauma for over nine years, having fled persecution in his home country, you know, we can, we can go to therapy, we can talk to each other, we can, we can get that source of inspiration so that we can continue to be in this fight with him. And I actually think it ties into this answer that, that, that I was gonna give, which is that stay grounded in real stories of, of people. Um, you know, ideas and abstractions and, and theories and, and arguments and talking points are one thing, but, you know, the way I develop my thoughts and, and, and positions on a lot of higher education comes actually, comes from the a, a college readiness program that we started in my office where we work with young people. And so getting to know them and, and watching them and helping them go through the college application process then helped us to understand some of the things that were broken about admissions that were creating barriers to communities to go to college. Um, and so stay grounded in that and certainly stay grounded in that um, rather than seeking out the symbolic gestures, the viral tweet or the um, you know, the, the loudest rally or first rally or, 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 or protest or whatever it might be. Focus on those concrete results and the way, and the way you'll, know, you'll, you'll know that you're doing that is by staying grounded and connected to actual individual constituents. Okay, why don't we have, um, I know you've had your hand up for a long time, you, and then why don't you two both, why don't one, two, three, ask your questions and then we'll let uh, the, the honorees answer um, whichever they want. And that's I'm Jerry Goldberg, uh, Cyrus's East Coast parent. But, <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, yeah. um, I have a question about you as well, Ambassador Kennedy. We've talked about all the successes you've had could you talk a bit about the sacrifices that you've had to make and to achieve your values? Uh, 
Do you want to ask a couple questions? So you, you two over there, I see you with your hands up. There are two women in the second row. Yeah, why don't you ask your questions and then. Hi, my name is Hema Quetzal. I'm from East Oakland and I'm a freshman at Stanford University. My question is to the Christinas. You know, people see the abolishment of detention centers as radical. And I personally believe in the abolishment of prisons, ICE and CBP as they're you know, horrible. Um, and so how do you convince people that this is the right move for the future? How do you convince people that immigration is a right, that immigration is good, and that this country needs to be more left than what it is today? So how do you have these conversations? Hi, my name is Valeria. I'm a first year student at Yale University. And my question is kind of on a similar thread as Hema's here. Um, I wanted to ask how you guys both envision um, the decriminalization of federal border policy, namely policies such as like the 1996 Immigration Act or Section 1325. How do you see a tangible abolishment of these policies or any sort of reimagining how we go about federal immigration policy? Great, well, um, I can start off. Um, you both know a lot about immigration, so I'm very excited. Um, thank you for being here, too. Um, uh, well, I think the answer is kind of two-part to both of uh, your questions. So one, um, you know, Christina and I started the first visitation program actually in the East Bay in Richmond at the West County Detention Facility, which is now closed. Um, there's a lot of immigration detention facilities that have closed in California, which is great to see, but we still have over 50,000 people in immigration detention. So how do we tackle this system at, at a federal level? And for us, we've always felt that it's a two-pronged approach. First, we have to monitor what's happening inside of these detention facilities in order to uplift the abuse and show how um, our tax dollars are being used to perpetrate this abuse. It's our way of saying to the public, to our elected representatives, that this is a, not a system that, that we want and this is, this is an abusive system. But we also feel that that alone isn't enough, that we have to not only envision what a country or a world without immigration detention would look like, but we also have to model it for them. So over the last couple of years, we've raised over $1.6 million that we've paid back to ICE to get people released, to bomb them out of immigration detention. And then we're providing them with post-release support and proving that there's really no reason, first, that they need to be detained, Second, that there should even be a bond system in which you have to pay to get somebody released. And our goal is to be able to really take the money that is currently being used to line the pockets of the shareholders of these private prison companies and actually put it towards community-based alternatives, which that doesn't mean ankle monitoring. What it really means is a system where we welcome immigrants. Um, so hopefully that answered your questions, but happy to talk more about the specifics of the 1996 laws too. And I would just add one thing, which is, you know, we see this immigration detention system as just one part of the mass incarceration system. And we know that over 60% of people, the 50,000 who are detained any given day, they're in private facilities. They're in private for-profit facilities. And those facilities also operate in the criminal justice space. And the only reason that we're locking people up on both sides of, of these issues is because it is enriching these private prison corporations. And so I think the more that we can draw the parallels between those things, and really, you know, get beyond the, the criminal rhetoric. Um, I think that's where we need to go. Well, I'll just um, answer a little bit. Um, and I think it's really what they said earlier. I think that um, when you are working with other people or feel that you can help other people, um, and that, or I'm sure for your, for your clients, uh, when they feel that you, are there to help them, I think those relationships are really, um, you appreciate those even more if you've had something difficult happen, which everyone has. And so I think the key is to not, is to stay engaged, to keep working, uh, and not to kind of uh, withdraw and feel like we can't make a difference. And so I think this year that's even more important than ever. And uh, I hope, I know all of you students here are, um, active and engaged, and um, that's really, the, I'm sure, the thing that will make your life uh, as rewarding as 
um, as these individuals here, and hopefully we'll have a new Frontier Award winner uh, here one day who will come back and uh, sit up here and answer all these questions. So um, if you want to end uh, with anything, we'd love to hear from you. If, if not, then I think we I will be in the audience for anyone here who um, wins the new Frontier Award, <laughs> I, I promise. Um, thank you again, Ambassador Kennedy. Thank you to the committee. Thank you to uh, all those who made this possible and to all the folks who asked such wonderful and incisive questions. Um, let's, let's continue the conversation um, on into the future. And uh, it's, it's, it's my job also to promote tourism, so I will tell you. <laughs> Please come and visit Washington State. I can tell it rains here, so you won't <laughs> mind in Seattle. Come visit us, all right? Take care. Thank, Thank you. you.